So we are talking about the war of the worldviews, and we've really been at this point kind of tracing the history of Western thought, uh, starting with with Christianity, with a Judeo-Christian theistic worldview, and working up through history, through uh, uh, deism, through atheistic naturalism, through nihilism, existentialism, really just kind of developing this Western philosophy uh, to the modern day. And what we're looking at today is postmodernism. And there really is the culmination of where all of that is led. And it is the predominant worldview philosophy in our culture today is postmodernism. Um, so next week, we'll then shift gears, having, having covered Western thought. Next week, we'll start uh, take a couple of weeks to talk about Eastern ways of thinking. And then we'll do a week on the Muslim worldview. So uh, that'll be some interesting stuff coming up after, after tonight. Proverbs 9.10 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. But in many ways, postmodernism is would say that recognizing the death of God is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, but of course, it's actually the end of postmodern wisdom, as we'll see, that when there is no God, as we've already seen in the, the past week, when we discount the existence of God, things unravel pretty quickly. Uh, Postmodern uh, ways of thinking claim to be just that, postmodern, after the modern era. It's what comes after the modern way of thinking. And in the book, James Sire argues that postmodernism really isn't postmodern or post anything. It's just the next logical step in the progression that we've seen from atheistic naturalism. And the ideas of postmodernism are really just those logical conclusions of the modern way of thinking. If, 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 if naturalists and existentialists, if they really lived out and carried out their conclusions that are nor, their natural end, they took their commitments seriously, then the end result is the postmodern way of thinking. And it fails analysis, as we'll get around to. It really is not a reasonable way of looking at the world. Postmodernism would describe itself as being anti-worldview. It rejects the idea of a worldview. Remember, we said that having a worldview is like looking at the horizon, right? And, and a horizon sort of gives you a boundary. It sets a boundary for your world, or at least the world as you can perceive it. It, it defines limits. And postmodernism says there is no limit. There is no horizon. There is no way to define the world around us. And so postmodernism kind of leaves us adrift in a sea of pluralism, of various equally valid truth claims, just all fighting for dominance. Uh, but there is no dominant truth claim. There is no absolute true or false, right or wrong. And so the end result of that is nothing less than cultural anarchy. It's just chaos. It's lawlessness. One critic of postmodernism described it as long on attitude and short on argument. <laughs> I like that. It's long on attitude, short on argument. But what is postmodernism? Is it a worldview? Is it the rejection of worldviews? Is it just another step in the modern atheistic naturalist descent into nihilism? Yes, all of the above. It's all of those things. And because of the claims of postmodernism, it's kind of hard to get a consensus definition from scholars as to exactly what postmodernism really is. The best you can really do is kind of to try to identify common elements. What are the, the, the key characteristic elements uh, and, and cultural contributions that make up postmodernism? So you can say that the postmodern worldview is a combination of rel relativism, pragmatism, uh, existentialism, naturalism, universalism, pluralism, multiculturalism, it encompasses all of that. And it's informed by disciplines like culture studies, gender studies, post-colonial theory, LGBTQ studies, and scholars like Jacques Derrida and Michael Foucault and Jean-Francois Lyotard, those are the leading voices in postmodernism. Now, it's interesting, the term postmodern was coined to describe an architectural style, 
So architects began to move away from the modern uh, theories of architecture where really the function defines the form. And modern architecture is very utilitarian, lots of straight edges or lots of clean curves. That's, that's modern uh, architecture. Uh, you think of, um, of uh, oh, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. You know, his house. So that, that's modern architecture. Postmodern architecture rejects the idea that the function of the building should have anything to do with the form of the building. And it really kind of looks back and borrows from lots of different motifs throughout history and different cultures. And it kind of just throws them all together. So I just, just for fun, uh, so that's a modern, that's modern architecture. That's postmodern architecture. And you can just see there, you've got like a giant, you know, uh, what is that, a Corinthian column there that is essentially part of the building. And that's just an office building. It's not, you know, any fancy place. Um, the, uh, the Guggenheim Museum in New York City is an example of classic modern architecture. But there's a Guggenheim in Spain that was built recently. It is vastly different. That is postmodern. I thought that was a great example. The difference between modern and postmodern architecture is really highlighted there. Uh, and another great example of postmodern architecture is this building. Does anybody know what building that is? Any James Bond fans out there? That's the MI6 building in London. Okay, that's, uh, that's the, the British, British Service Building. Service building. And it is, it is also, it is postmodern, also postmodern, architecture postmodern architecture because they saw the blend, blend of both sort of an industrial, industrial look with the idea of an Aztec temple. So it sort of is meant to evoke this idea of an Aztec temple meets industrial. I know, it's not a very English thing, is it? So, so that's kind of where postmodernism started, actually, was with architecture. But then there was a French sociologist, uh, Leotard, who first used the term to describe a broader cultural shift. And then it began, began to be adopted more by people in sociology and in English departments to describe a kind of cultural and literary analysis. Leotard defined postmodernism as incredulity toward meta narratives. We'll talk about what that means in a minute. Basically, it means there's no longer a worldview. There's no, a meta narrative is an overarching story. There is no overarching story. Uh, every story, every worldview, every truth is equally valid, is equally credible as any other. So remember, existentialism said nothing has meaning until I give it meaning. Postmodernism says nothing is valid or true unless I or my community make it true, make it valid. So as we unpack postmodernism, we're going to follow Sire. Uh, he does a really great job in this chapter of tracing pre-modern, modern, and postmodern. And so let's talk about what that means. Pre-modern is basically theistic Judeo-Christian worldview. This is what was the predominant worldview in the Western world through the 17th century. Okay, so when we talk, when we talk about pre-modern, we're basically saying theistic. Christian uh, and Jewish worldviews. Then the modern, which began with Descartes, and it encompassed naturalism, nihilism, existentialism. So beginning of the 17th century, began to, uh, the Enlightenment uh, began the modern era, and then the postmodern era began in the late 19th century with Frederick Nietzsche. All right, so modern, or pre-modern, let's think Christian theism. Modern is mainly naturalism, and all of its other isms that developed out of it, and postmodern is what we're talking about tonight, postmodernism. Um, now, the postmodern didn't develop out of the schools of philosophy as previous worldviews did. So all the worldviews we talked about from deism on kind of developed out of the schools of philosophy, not postmodernism. It came out of sociology. It's driven by sociology. Now, this is an important distinction because what's philosophy concerned about? Philosophy is concerned about with uh, metaphysics and epistemology, issues of being, existence, and reality, issues of knowing. What do we know and how do we know it? That's what philosophy wants to know. What is, what is real? What is true? And what difference does that make in our life? Sociology is concerned with how people behave. 
particularly as they behave as a part of a larger group. They don't care about what is true or what is real, but about how being, knowing, and living ethically, how those things arise and function in society. Okay, that's that's what sociology wants to know. So unlike all the other worldviews we've looked at, postmodernism then doesn't begin with those metaphysical questions. It doesn't begin with ultimate reality. Remember, everything we've looked at before, we talked about what do they say about ultimate reality? You know, there is a God, there isn't a God. Matter is all that exists, so there is a supernatural realm, or, or we don't know what, what really is. Uh, but that is where philosophy and all of the other uh, worldviews began. But postmodernism begins with language and how language functions to construct meaning. So let's think about the history of worldviews that we've talked about already. If we think about pre-modern, it was concerned with being, right? God, in the beginning, God, right? And God created the heavens and the earth. And God made man in his image, right? Those are issues of being. What is? And how did we come to be? The modern world said that's not as important as knowing. What do we know and how do we know it? Postmodern moves from being to knowing to meaning. What does it mean and where does that meaning come from? So let's think about these shifts from being to knowing. Again, the pre-modern was concerned about a just society based on scripture, on the Bible. Modernity was concerned with using human reasoning to guide us toward justice, that we can deduce ethics and morality and what is right and wrong. Postmodern says there is no universal standard for justice. Every value, every moral is defined by each individual or by each group. So the pre-modern theistic and the modern naturalistic worldviews all begin with ontology. They all begin with the idea that being comes before knowing, right? Because if there's no thing, if nothing exists, how can I know about it, right? So being has to come before knowing. I know this cup of coffee is here because it is. It exists, right? It didn't exist because I knew about it. I know about it because it exists. But if you remember what existentialism did, it flipped that script and it placed knowing before being. Remember, the uh, Descartes said, I think, therefore I am, right? Thinking comes before being. So we go from being in the pre-modern sense to knowing in the modern sense, but with the rise of existentialism, it began to go from knowing to meaning. Uh, particularly 18th century thinkers like David Hume. Have you heard that name? Immanuel Kant? Probably heard that name. The focus became knowing how we know. Doubting the existence of cause and effect. Is cause and effect really a thing? And kind of even questioning Newtonian physics. And then the idea that the self creates reality, that you kind of create your own reality. George Hegel exalted the human self almost to godlike dimensions in these ideas that, that really my existence, my reality is self made. And all I can really know is that I know that I exist, right? Nietzsche took that further to doubt the existence of self. How do I know that I exist? How do I know that I'm really here? How, and and so, so here's the argument, right? Uh, Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. Nietzsche said, what if it is the thinking that creates the I rather than the I creating the thinking? What if I am because I think? That's what Nietzsche said. What if there is only, and they, they took it further, what if there's only thinking? What if, what if all of this is just a flow of language and ideas without origin, without meaning, without a, a destination, without a goal? Does there have to be a me to think? Or are my thoughts just part of some river of thought that just runs its way through the universe? Well, as you can imagine, this line of thinking leads to the death of truth. And he's just famous for saying 
you know, the death of God, that God is dead. Isn't that a truth? If everything is relative, if there's nothing I can be certain of, then there is no truth. So this brings us to our first, we're not going to look at all eight worldview questions because postmodernism kind of rejects this whole way of, of thinking that we've been engaging in. We're going to look at a few of them that are relevant, like knowledge. Postmodernism says the truth about reality itself is forever hidden from us. All we can do is tell stories about it. You can never really know the truth. You can really never know reality. All you can do is tell stories about what you think or how you perceive it. So again, let's trace this line of thinking. Theism in pre-modern times said uh, the, the universal meta-narrative was revealed to us by God. That there is a meta-narrative. There is an overarching story. We probably call it the redemptive story, the story of God, the you know, creation, fall, redemption, consummation, when Christ returns. The modern says that the autonomy of human reason has access to truth that corresponds with reality. Right? So again, it's all about what you can see, taste, touch, feel, experience. And our reason can observe all of this and deduce truth from it. Postmodernism says we create truth as we construct language to serve our purposes. So truth isn't something that is. Truth isn't something that we derive from the world around us. Truth is something we construct with our language. You see the shift there, the difference there? Apart from our systems of language, then, we can know nothing. And since all language is of human origin, we can't even determine whether what we say is true or not. All we can do is determine whether it's useful. So one of the first things about truth, postmodernism will tell us, is that truth is pragmatic. It's pragmatic. Truth just has to work. If it works, it's true. So instead of asking, is something truthful, the postmodern person says, is it useful? Useful is more important than truthful. Now think about what this would mean to religious belief, right? If no one's story is any more or less true than anyone else's story, if, if it's all just a matter of what works for me, you know, does it satisfy me? Does it give me what I want? You know, it's true for me if I derive a sense of being from it. It's true for me if it gives me inner peace and fulfillment. It's true for me if it works for me, if it helps me order my life, if it helps me overcome an addiction, then it's true. This is where we get this idea of your truth. People will say that. If that's your truth, I mean, that works for you. You do you is another thing we hear today. You do you. Whatever works for you, you do that. That's postmodernism. Truth is pragmatic. Secondly, he believes the truth is personal. Richard Rorty says that truth is what one's peers let one get away with. Boy, I, that is the mantra of politicians, isn't it? <laughs> truth is whatever NBC Nightly News lets you get away with. Truth is whatever the media will let me get by with. That's truth. Which is why a president can tell us that a $3.5 trillion spending bill will cost zero dollars. <laughs> And figure that out. We live in a post-truth world, right? Truth is what works. So why can't that be true? Why can't $3.5 trillion be zero? I'm going to go try to buy a new sports car and tell them that, no, the real cost of this is zero. It doesn't work that way, does it? That won't work for me. That's not pragmatic. So, so you know, whatever, you, and another way to look at this is truth is whatever you can get people to agree to. Have you ever noticed how so many people today will change their beliefs, their morals, their politics based on opinion polls? Here are polls all the time. 55% of Americans now believe that such and such is okay. Oh, well, then it must be okay. I guess I'll change the way I think about this. Because 55% of Americans agree you know, with that. It's the idea that truth is whatever you get people agree to. In fact, the key is to get other people to use your language. Because if you can get people to use your language, then you get them to believe your story. That's one of the reasons why there's an assault on language today. 
It's the language that you use. It's the words that you use. It's how you, it's what pronouns you call someone by. They want us to adopt their language because if we adopt their language, then we become a part of their truth. Texts and statements mean only what the reader or hearer wants them to mean. That's another part of this. So, whereas the modern way of thinking is, and probably the way that you guys have been thinking and learned at school, is when you read the Declaration of Independence, you read it in the context of Thomas Jefferson wrote this, Ben Franklin held, and it was, you know, in the context of America wanting to separate from England and King George and all of that. And there's meaning to it that the author put into it, right? The, the, the Declaration of Independence means what Thomas Jefferson wanted it to mean. For the Bible, Matthew, when you read Matthew, it means what Matthew wrote it to mean, what God inspired it to mean. Postmodernism says no. The author's meaning and intent doesn't matter. You give it meaning. The reader gives it meaning. The interpreter, the listener gives it meaning. We are the source of the meaning, not the author. Now, if you're like me, that's nonsense. But that's the postmodern way of thinking. And no one interpretation is better than another. You can read Hamlet, and you can come away with a different take on it than I can, and that's just as valid as mine. And, and those are both just as valid, if not more valid, than what Shakespeare actually intended. So language doesn't mean just one thing. Language can mean whatever the reader, the hearer, wants it to mean. Derrida talked about, he called it the hermeneutical theory, and he argued that no single definitive interpretation of the text is possible. And you try that with a contract. <laughs> well, you know, there's no one right way to read this contract. It's whatever we each want it to mean. Well, that's Again, that's anarchy. That's chaos. You can't have agreements. You can't work in society that way. And Derrida called for the deconstruction of Western thought. He said that words do not mean just one thing. They're capable of the multiplicity of meanings. And he actually criticized what he calls logocentrism of Western thought, which is the idea that words matter and that we are a word-centered, you know, literate word-based society. He criticized that. He, you know, now it's true that all language does break down at some point. That's true. And it's true that sometimes you may not know an author's intent or meaning. But postmoderns take that to the extreme. That all language breaks down almost instantly. All language needs to be deconstructed. You can't know any author's intent or meaning, so why even try? And again, this becomes another form of nihilism. Because if there's no inherent meaning in the United States Constitution, if, if, if the people that wrote it didn't mean anything by it, then it's meaningless, right? It's worthless. I mean, why even pay attention to it? So that is the view that truth is personal. Now, if we look at the third aspect of truth, let's consider Humanity, what postmodernism believes about humanity. And one of the things, we'll look at another in a minute, is that stories give communities their cohesive character. Stories give communities their cohesive character. Now, you would think, based on what we just talked about, that the postmodern mindset leads into absolute chaos and anarchy, right? Just, just total, a total mess. But James Sire in the book explains that, that there are two, two things that postmoderns will say that, that against that. One is that people have to believe stories are true or live as if they are. That the people, you know, like for example, they would say we as Christians believe that that story is true. We live as if it's true. And then they would say secondly, that the community has to believe the same basic story. So our church can function and exist because we all believe the same basic story, right? Then you expand that out when you think about Thompson and McDuffie County, right? So there are stories that we believe as people in Thompson and McDuffie County, and we all believe the same basic story. You expand that out. So a nation, what is a nation? What is the United States? But a group of people that believe a similar basic story about human dignity and rights and freedom and 
and the source and the beginning of our nation and this idea of American exceptionalism and, and a good work ethic and trying to better the world. And you would say there's this worldview, this story that we share. Whether it's true or not doesn't matter. The postmodern is the fact that we all at least live as if we believe it's true. And, and for that, that's how society works. But the problem with that is that what happens when people within a community start believing radically different stories? That's where we are as a nation. I talked about this at Kiwanis on Monday. The, the question was, uh, why are we so divided as a country? Well, I think the reason we're so divided as a country is because we're operating from two different playbooks. We, we, believe, we believe different stories. And the postmodern story, the postmodern worldview is so radically different from the biblical, traditional American worldview that has been predominant until very recently. So we'll, we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Um, and, and this is really where postmodernism begins to unravel, one of many places we'll see that it unravels. Because it says there's no objective reality, right? There is no objective reality. There is no meta narrative. There is no overarching story. And worldviews are just tools of oppression, right? So the only reason people have a worldview is to oppress people with it and, and to exert power over them. And Leotard called this the incredulity toward meta narratives. He also calls it the hermeneutic of suspicion. But as we'll see, this, this doesn't hold water. And, that, and, it, and it ties into this idea that truth is power. Truth is pragmatic, it's personal, and it's power. So let's look at knowledge and ethics, right? So the postmodern will say that all narratives, all stories, all worldviews are just a mask for a play for power. And any one narrative used as a meta-narrative, so if I take my story and I say, no, this is the story, this is what's true and real, that's oppressive. I'm oppressing people with that. Now, again, think about how incoherent this is. Because isn't this, the postmodern worldview, isn't it a narrative? And are they putting it forth as a meta-narrative? Because what they're saying is this isn't just true for them. They're saying this is true for everyone, right? But if that's the case, if is it not any more credible than any other story? I and mean, by their own logic, how can they say that postmodernism's view of truth and stories is better than the Christian view of truth and stories? But that's what they do, contradicting their very belief. It's a complete contradiction. If truth is relative, then there are no objective truths or absolutes. There are only stories that when they believe, give the storyteller power. But isn't that what they're doing? Giving us a story to believe that gives them power? Yes, it is. And this leads to the claim from postmodernism that any other story than my own is oppressive. So your story, if it's different from my story, it's an oppressive story. So let's think about, again, the difference between pre-modern, modern, and post-modern. The pre-modern, the meta-narrative, has been revealed to us by God in the Bible. To the modern person, the meta-narrative of universal reason uh, reveals truth about reality. But to the post-modern, all meta-narratives are power plays. It's all about the struggle for power. So let's go back and look at another aspect of humanity in the eyes of postmodernism. There is no substantial self. In other words, my self has no substance. There is no substantial, discernible, objectifiable self. Humans make themselves who they are by the language they construct about themselves. Now, this, I think, is one of the best examples of how postmodernism flows right out of existentialism. This sounds a lot like what we talked about last week with existentialism. Remember the, the idea that existence precedes essence? That we make ourselves by our choices. That's what an existentialist would say. We make ourselves by our choices, by our actions. Right? The self-made man kind of an idea. But postmodern takes us to the extreme. We are only what we say ourselves to be. 
It's, it's not, not about what I do, it's about what I say. How do I talk about myself? What kind of language do I use to describe myself? And that becomes true. Now again, this goes right to the heart of the whole transgender debate. And the whole idea of using the you know, right pronouns and don't dead name somebody and stuff like that. That if I call myself a woman, then I'm a woman. And you better agree with me. Because if you don't, you're being oppressive. You're imposing your world and your story on me. This is my story. Now, it doesn't matter that I'm oppressing you by forcing my story on you, right? I'm forcing you to be a part of my story. They don't see it that way. They just see that, that hey, I describe myself this way. I use these words about myself this way. That is my truth. And if you contradict that, shame on you. You're an evil, no good, very bad person. So again, let's look at this development. From the idea that humans have dignity as beings made in God's image, to the idea that humans are just a product of our DNA that developed by chance, the random mutation and evolution and survival of the fittest, to the idea that the self is constructed merely by the language that is used to describe itself. And of course, this has enormous impact on the idea of morality and ethics. So to the postmodern mind, morality, kind of like knowledge to the existentialist, morality is a linguistic construct. Social good is whatever society takes it to be. Now, this is just the moral extension of the idea that truth is whatever we decide to be. If truth is whatever I decided to be, then what is morally good is whatever we decide it to be. Because again, it's all about the language. Now, I'm sure you see the problem with this, because what if a future society decides that fascism is a moral good? What if a society in the future believes that ethnic cleansing is a good thing to do? Does that make it good? Just because 56% of Americans say it is, does that make it good? Does that make it right? Of course we would say no. But this kind of radical ethical relativism is all you have. If there's no higher authority, if there's no standard outside of humanity to tell us what is right and wrong, true and false, good and evil, then all we have is what we decide, what we determine it to be. Foucault argues that the greatest good, now, now listen to this, and tell me this isn't exactly the, the, the attitude of our culture. He says the greatest good is your own freedom to maximize your pleasure. That's the greatest good. It's your own freedom to maximize your pleasure. Which means that anybody attempting to stop you from that, any laws, any morals, to try to keep you from doing what feels good is wrong. It's oppressive. And the freedom is the loosening of those morals. The decriminalization of certain laws. Now, this is like taking libertarianism to the extreme, right? That's exactly what postmodernism does. And we see this play out as well in art and literature. Again, the idea that the value of something or the meaning of something isn't in the artist, it's not in the author, it's in me as the reader, me as the observer, me as the one watching the film or listening to the music. I'm the one that gives it value and meaning. There's no transcendent standard of what's beautiful. There's no transcendent meaning behind anything. And of course, this applies to, to justice and ethics as well. In fact, they kind of really blend together in this quote by Emily Thorne. Justice, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder. Some see an innocent victim. Others will see evil incarnate getting exactly what's deserved. So you've heard the expression, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Again, it's kind of a postmodern way of thinking. There is no objective, objective beauty. There's no standard of beauty. It's what, if you think it's beautiful, then it's beautiful. If you think it's just, then it's just. 
David Hume said beauty is no quality in things themselves. It exists merely in the mind which contemplates them. And each mind perceives a different beauty. Now, we would look at that and say, you know, you know, like some of these things, there's a little bit of truth in that. You know, I mean, you know, I might think something's beautiful and you might not think something's beautiful. So, so it is subjective, but they reject any kind of idea that there is such a thing as an objective standard. Do I have a question? Okay. Well, I heard some bad comments. Uh, uh, well, let's take a place to stop and take a quick break. Are there any questions or thoughts? I'm going to just kind of plow through this. Well, if you have something, to jump in there. Okay. We have one time that you question her. She says, I know it's not so, but it makes a better story. <laughs> That is postmodernism. Yeah. I know it, it, it's, it's not so, but it makes a better story. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a very postmodern expression. Yeah. So the pre-modern belief was that ethics were based on the character of the transcendent God. Okay? It's wrong to murder someone because people are made in God's image. And God told us it's wrong to murder. Okay? That's simple. Modernism says that it's based on universal human reason. That murder is wrong because... We've reasoned out that murder is wrong. You know, that, that, that it's our own mind, our own rationality, our own ability to accurately and consistently discern what is right and wrong. That's what makes murder wrong. But to the postmodern, ethics, morality is just a multiplicity of languages used to distinguish right from wrong. So again, everything with postmodernism goes back to the words, to the language, to the story. That's what it's about, the narrative. So if something is right or wrong, it's simply because, not because it is, but because we say it is. We say it's right. We say it's wrong. Now, what does this do with their view of history and especially core commitments? Well, postmodernism is in flux. We are in the midst of this, right? Everything else we've talked about, we kind of are looking back through history at it. We kind of step away from it and analyze it. We're in the midst of this. And there are some people that are saying that oh, postmodernism is already out the door and something new is coming in already. And but the truth is, we don't know because we're living in the moment. And so, postmodernism is in flux, as is its take on the significance of human history, because again, we're in this moment. And that means that core commitments are in flux. But one thing you could say postmodernists are committed to an endless stream of shifting whatevers. Yeah, it's like you're a teenager, whatever. That's sort of postmodernism when it comes to commitments, whatever. Because there's no standard of truth, there's no absolutes here. Well, any questions? We'll stop there uh, for a second. Any questions about the the beliefs, the uh, the developments and beliefs of postmodernism? The ideas of truth as being pragmatic or personal or all about power. So I'm not going to look at that yin yang joint. Okay. And we'll definitely get into that next week with Eastern Eastern ways of thinking. Does this have anything to do with the Nazi way of thinking? With the what? Nazi. You know, Nazi. Nazi. Uh, Nazism really, I mean, it comes out of German. And the German is. is you know, a hotbed of a lot of philosophical developments. But I would say Nazism really is sort of the the fruit of the modern way of thinking. It, it, it's the it's the fruit of modernity, and really, it was not. It was it was really World War II, and it was the Holocaust and the dropping of the of the atom bomb or the H bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those really kind of brought the modern. Era to it to a, a hard crash. And postmodernism, in a lot of ways, is a reaction to that. Because modernity, I mean, you got Hitler, you know, the eugenics, I and mean, that's all about Darwinism. That's all about, um, you know, his, his kind of thinking those ways. Um, and that's not postmodernism. Because postmodernism is going to say that, hey, you know, you can't go exterminating all these people because, you know, they, they've got their right to live out their story. We've got to affirm them. We've got to. You know, these, these, this, that, the other would be more of the postmodern way of thinking. 
The other was just like, no, I don't agree with them. Take them out. Does that make sense? Yeah. Without getting too much historical analysis there. Um, let's, let's talk about, about the influence of postmodernism. Literature. literature. Now, as, as I said, said really postmodernism, the term began in architecture, but the, the, the theory, the philosophy of postmodernism began in literature. And again, if you think about it this way, pre-modern focused on theology, the modern focused on science, but postmodernism focuses on literature. It's about linguistics. It's about literary theory. And, and, and a big part of the development of postmodernism were the writings of Marx and Freud, uh, the school of new criticism and historical criticism, again, coming out of Europe. Uh, and you add to that the developments in the early 20th century, late 19th century, about anthropology, sociology, feminism, linguistics, and then you throw in modern philosophers like Derrida, and, and you've got this birth of postmodern literary criticism. Now, Sire discusses, uh, he talks about how English departments uh, really became flooded in the, in the early first half of the 20th century, became flooded with literary critics that came from all these different fields of study, and that they really became sort of like celebrities in the universities. The, 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 these linguistic and literary critics were just praised and celebrated, and one professor observed that nearly every English professor is either a theorist or a cultural studies specialist. See, literature, beginning in the you know, first half of the 20th century, and it just is it's infiltrated. You know, a lot of these things, they start in like Harvard, Yale, and, and Oxford, and Cambridge. They start, and, and, and then they, they trickle their way down to the state universities, and they trickle their way down to the community colleges, and they trickle their way down into the high schools. And that's kind of how this stuff sort of works. So a lot of these ideas have been around for decades we're only really starting to hear about these things and see the influences because it's gone from just being this ivory tower academic discussion to actually being taught in elementary schools. Right? So that, that's one of the big shifts that we've seen. But when you and I learn literature, we, we learn it in a traditional way. Right? You, you read it, you, um, you try to understand the, the author and what he was trying to say and that sort of stuff. Now everything is read and interpreted through the lenses of politics, Gender, race, social justice, everything is interpreted through those ways. So that's postmodern influence in literature. And, and, and that applies to, I think, to, to movies and television and music. I mean, just all of the, the arts, really. What about history? Sire says the pastness of the past disappears in the midst of the present moment. He's describing the postmodern impact on history there. Modern historicism believes that the meaning of events is found in their historical context, right? The meaning of events is found in the past when those things happen, right? What's the meaning of uh, Lexington and Concord, the shock heard around the world? Well, you have to look at what was going on between England, United States, and the taxes and all that. You have to interpret that in, not with postmodern history. Postmodern historians deny the fixedness of the past. The reality of the past doesn't exist apart from what the historian wants to make of it. History is what you make it. It is what you interpret it to be. So again, there's no objective truth about the past. So when I was in history, teachers would try to put the students back in time, right? They try to imagine what life was like. You might even go on a field trip to, you know, Williamsburg or something and try to see, try to get a, a feel of what life was like in colonial America, stuff like that. Put yourself in the shoes of, of you know, Benjamin Franklin or Abraham Lincoln or whoever. But that's not what postmodernists do. They create a past in the image of the present. They, they really practice what's called eisegesis. They read the present into the past. They interpret it in view of today, which is why you got people not just pulling down the statues of Civil War Confederate generals, 
But as he pulled down statues of Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson, Frederick Douglass, and, and what's happening is, is, is we are interpreting past people by today's standards. So rather than put them in their historical context, try to understand them at the time, no, we judge them by today's standards and say they're racist. And therefore, they must be erased from history. So this whole, just this debate over monuments and statues really comes down to a difference in the modern, traditional way of thinking about history and the postmodern way of thinking about history. It also is where the 1619 Project comes from. And this is the whole New York Times-based essay that's now being turned into a curriculum to teach in the school. It says that the America's founding was not 1776. It was 1619 when the first slaves came over. You know, forget the fact that it wasn't the United States that did that. That was England and France and Spain that did that. But that's when America began, they say. And, and she kind of goes on from there with all of this history and thinking that actual historians that still believe in traditional views of history have just lambasted. I mean, they've written letters, they've written articles, they've really just said this is revisionist history. This isn't historically accurate. That doesn't matter in the postmodern world. Because the facts of the past don't matter as much as the narrative today. The story today and its impact, that's what really matters. And especially the mainstream of Western thought is ignored in favor of things that are marginal to Western culture, right? So you downplay the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant American, right? And, and again, this goes back to the idea of powers. And that words and meta narratives and stories are all about power plays. Okay, well, people like me have been at the top of the power pyramid far too long. So we've got to deconstruct that. We've got to pull down anything that's Western way of thinking. We've got to pull down anything that's Christian, anything that's predominantly white or male or, or heterosexual or cisgender or whatever. That's all got to be discounted. We've got to elevate these voices on the margin, which is where you get this whole intersectionality, critical race theory idea that my view as a, as a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant cisgender heterosexual male doesn't count as much as the transgender lesbian feminist Latino over here. That that view is more important than my view simply by virtue of our group identity. That's where this leads to this view of history. It also impacts science. Now, thankfully, most scientists today have not yet fallen, although I think over the past year and a half, it's been happening more, but most scientists, whether they're Christian or atheist, are still critical realists. A scientist necessarily have to believe there is a definite, defined reality external to themselves, right? That there is a reality that I can observe, I can test, I can, I can impact, right? If that's not true, you can't do science, right? Science kind of hinges on that. Postmodernists, though, are the opposite of critical realists. They're anti-realists. They say there's no way to know any connection between what we think and say and what actually is. There's no way to know that. Scientific truth, they say, is really the language we use to get our way. Now, think about this. Science is the language we use to get our way. Science is what scientists say it is. It's just another set of meta narratives. It's just another story. Which is, again, how you have actual courses in schools now that try to tell you that Newton and Einstein and, and, and these people were wrong. Because, again, they're white men. And therefore, we can't study them. We can't listen to what they say. That, that, that science, and you even hear stories about, you know, that you know, science is being racist. The weather is being racist. You know, that, that this is, is sexist because, you know, these were all men that developed these theories. As if the facts of gravity have any bearing on that whatsoever. <laughs> But we hear this today when politicians say things like follow the science, the science, right? 
follow the science. What is the science? It's what I say it is. That's why Fauci can say one thing in March and another thing the next year and nobody bats an eye. He's Fauci. Whatever he says is true is true. This is postmodernism. I'm not trying to be political. This is postmodernism. Now, there's this guy who I, I just learned about over the past week. He's my new hero. Uh, his name is Alan Sogol. He submitted a paper, 1996. He submitted a paper to an academic journal that is called Social Text. Now, that's a, that's a postmodern journal if I've ever heard of one. And the title of this article was Transgressing the Boundaries. It's like a scientific paper. Not just an article. He was submitting an academic scientific paper. Transgressing the boundaries towards the transformative hermeneutics of quantum gravity. Now, just think about that title. Hermeneutics means like interpretation of words. The interpretation of quantum gravity. Is gravity interpreted? Maybe I don't interpret gravity and you different than you interpret. I can draw this cup. It's not going to fall. No, that's not. That doesn't work that way. So he he submitted this as a hoax, and he did it. And he admits later on in another journal that it was a hoax. And he says, "I wrote and submitted this to expose the absurdity of postmodern cultural analysis, especially in the sciences." One article described it like this, liberally citing work by feminist epistemologists, philosophers of science and critical theorists. Sokol endorsed the notion that scientists had no special claim to scientific knowledge. Just as postmodern theory revealed that so-called facts about the physical world were mere social or political constructs, he wrote, like the idea that you're a male or you're a female, right? That's just a, that's just a social political construct. Uh, he wrote, quantum gravity undermined the concept of existence itself, making way for a liberatory science and emancipatory mathematics. That's what his article wrote about that. But I want to read you an excerpt from his actual article. Feminist and post-culturalist critiques have demystified the substantive content of mainstream Western scientific practice. Revealing the ideology of domination concealed behind the facade of objectivity, it has thus become increasingly apparent that physical reality, no less than social reality, is at bottom a social and linguistic construct. Did that make any sense to you? Because it doesn't make any sense. He literally strung together catchphrases and buzzwords, and he wrote an entire academic paper on this, submitted it to an actual academic journal, and it passed the editorial board and was published. <laughs> and he's not the only one that's done this. In the past few years, somebody took an AI program and literally just had it just pump out gibberish. They submitted it as a scientific article to a journal and it got published. And the reason this kind of stuff is happening is because postmodernism says, Who am I to say that's not true? Who am I to say that's inaccurate or not right? If you're a credential and you've got a you know a PhD, you know, you have a PhD behind your name, it's going in. This is the world in which we live, the world in which we're told to follow the science. Oh, actually, I actually have that for you to look at. Okay. Um, all right, lastly, let's look at theology, and then we're going to uh, take a break and, and end today. We'll come back next week and look at the critical response to postmodernism. I knew this was going to happen today. This is such a good topic. So postmodernism basically is the antithesis of biblical Christianity. It is completely opposed to Christianity. Now, a lot of postmodern people will describe themselves as spiritual. Okay, so there's a lot of spirituality among postmodern thinkers. If you look at the millennial generation, generation Z, you know, they describe themselves as spiritual and being very open to spirituality. Uh, Richard Rorty described this postmodern doctrine of, of history. He said it's helped free us from theology and metaphysics, from the temptation to look for an escape from time and chance, no longer worshiping anything. Nothing is divine. No trace of divinity remains in form of a divine world or self. That's postmodernism. So postmodernists will completely discount the idea 
of biblical inspiration and will emphasize modern reinterpretations of the Bible over what the historical interpretations of the Bible have been, much less the intent of the author, which they will say you cannot know the intent of the author. Now, some uh, who their theology has been influenced by postmodernism, they now write what they call authiologists, like a uh, backslash authiologists. Um, and the idea is that it's not theology, it's also not non theology, it's like this confluence of theology and non theology, whatever that means. That is not now, some people will try to find some good things in the postmodern moment uh, and try to use that as a way to build a bridge and share, share Christ. And some of these are valid. Um, you know, they, they build on this emphasis on an openness to spirituality that many uh, postmodern thinkers have. Um, the emphasis of imagery, of art. You know, and you just think about uh, today uh, when you get on social media, what catches your eye and makes you stop more? A bunch of text or a picture? It's a picture. And you think about when you text somebody, especially the kids, when you text somebody, do you just use words or do you also use emojis, right? Pictures. So postmodernism puts this emphasis on imagery, on artistry. Well, you know, we can use that to try to connect with people and reach them. Uh, postmodernism emphasizes the experiential. Okay, it's about experience more than it is about propositional. You know, it's faith is not something, it's not a set of propositions you believe, it's something you experience. Well, you know, there's a little bit of something to that. And, and so we can connect with, with the millennials and people that feel very disconnected by offering them worshipful experiences, by helping our worship services to be something that is uh, very structured and, and experiential. Uh, think about baptism of the Lord's Supper. You know, those are imagery. Those are experiential forms of worship, so kind of building off of that, uh, also emphasizing the pragmatic values of Christianity, you know, that, that yes, Christianity isn't just true, it's also, it works, it does work, it, it is real and it works and it benefits you. So helping people to understand that, uh, the emphasis on community and relationships, uh, uh, authenticity, humility, um, you know, these, these are some at least byproducts of some of the postmodern ways of thinking that we can use to our advantage uh, without having to buy into the premise of postmodernism. So we'll, when we come back next week, we will look at the critical response to uh, postmodernism, and you can kind of see in your notes there kind of where we're going with that, but uh, we'll do that, and then we'll jump into Eastern ways of thinking. Um, any, any closing thoughts or questions? So then when we talk about history and the way the postmodern looks at it, I think that's one of the areas that has really uh, enabled them to develop the cancel culture. Yes. That what you said five years ago, off the cuff, is brought up today. Right. And, and now I'm applying today's standards to it, and you were a horrible person for saying that five years ago. That's right. 20 years ago, or yep. out of law. Yeah, so for example, when it comes to, to same sex marriage, right? So you can be fired from your company, you can be erased from social media, you can have all kinds of horrible things happen to you today simply by saying you don't agree with same sex marriage, much less, much less you don't want to bake a cake for their wedding. You get all kinds of trouble. But you go back to 2008, Barack Obama said that he was against same sex marriage. So you say, hey, I'm just saying what Barack Obama once said. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Because you read, they read, see, they conveniently read back into him what he believes now. That's, that's the thing about postmodernism, because words are power plays. I mean, postmodernism admits that. What they don't admit is that they themselves use words for power plays. It's not just a critique for them. It's actually their methodology. And so you can manipulate truth, you can manipulate the narrative, the story, to make it say what you want to say for your own purposes. It's terrifying. So you're manipulating things once. Yes. Our great grandkids will never know history. Not if things don't change. The way it does. 
Great act to have. And then there are already history books in schools right now that are already revisions. Yeah. Already, they're already there. Our daughter lives in South Florida and she teaches and works with people whose grandparents escaped Cuba in the 1950s. Mm. Uh -huh. And she says they are astounded that we are where we are and that we are actually accepting the things that their grandparents fled to escape. Yep. Yep. That's exactly right. But what you're doing tonight is taking action, being informed, thinking about these things, learning about this. That, that's at least a start to how we push back. 